First of all, congratulations, uh, Rebecca. Today is the opening day of the movie in theaters, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, absolutely. Uh, our friends at Netflix are, are giving a very generous uh, theatrical rollout to the film, and then it'll be on the streaming platform, I think, on November 10th. Uh, which is great. So I, I want to start off, Re Rebecca. Um, we were just talking outside. Uh, you know, as a first-time director, I think that you set yourself up for so many challenges on this film, and you made some really bold choices that I think made it even harder to get the film made. You wanted it in black and white and in four by three, and I would say without the use of a traditional score. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about... Um, you know, as a storyteller and for this particular story, how you developed that look and that approach to the sound of the film. Mm. Yes, it wasn't an easy ask of financiers, yes. Um, I, I read the book 13 years ago and I started writing the script, the first draft of the script, which had a lot of holes um, immediately afterwards and sort of did a very rough draft in 10 days and then stuck it in a drawer for six years <laughs> um, and then got it out and spent seven years trying to convince everyone to let me make it. But the during the course of that first draft and that first read of the book, I would say that all the big ideas happened then. I mean, I think I was 20 or so pages into the book when I was like, well, absolutely, it has to be black and white. This is not even a it's non-negotiable, it makes so much sense, it works in a funny way, even though it it nods to the period and to our sense of period, it also contemporizes it in an odd way. I can talk more about that if you want, but it's a slightly complicated idea. <laughs> I suppose it's because at first blush it feels like it's, um, it feels like it's literal. You know, this is a black and white world, therefore this is a black and white film. But it's not. It's really about our perception of that literalness um, and how that our, that perception is wrong. You know, we try to we instantly make this translation with our eye to categorize everybody. You know, you're a man, you're a woman, you're black, you're white, you're blah, 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 blah. And on and on and on it goes. But none of these things, just like the film is suggesting, are the whole of somebody. And they can also be very limiting. You know, the more rigid these constraints are the more likely we are to spill out the sides of them and even black and white film we talk about it as black and white but it's gray it's about all the gray areas so you know that was really the the seed of that idea and the four three aspect ratio was was again something that came to me pretty quickly although i kept it under my hat for a really long time and i think possibly naively because i didn't understand how big of an ask that would be you know, and I also, I didn't really know about aspect ratios. I look, I was a film geek growing up. I watched every movie I could get my hands on. But I, you know, so in my head, I was like, it has to, it has to look constrained and boxy like those old movies do um, and skinny. And I <laughs> was how I kept describing it. And then eventually someone was like, you mean like a 4-3 aspect ratio? <laughs> I'm like, yes. Um, but it's, Again, it's about constraint. I mean, the sort of the the biggest challenge about this adaptation is how do you? I mean, in a way, it's it's easy to show the literal one, the person who's living their life in hiding, hiding their racial identity, and is constantly, con obviously, or you expect her to be constrained by that. But within that, she's actually very free. The sort of challenge filmically is showing how the one who's ostensibly living a comfortable life and not concealing her racial identity and doing all the right things, how she is imprisoned and how she is restricted and constrained by those societal expectations of being the right kind of woman, the right kind of mother, the right kind of wife, the right kind of member of the black community, all of these, the right kind of partner also. And... Uh, you know, so I guess the four three, in a sense, slightly puts her in this pr imprisoned space, so that becomes visual. And um, those were the big ideas that never went away. Uh, the sound was also something that felt like the sort of missing piece 
of the puzzle, as it were. Because to do a film in black and white and 4-3, you of course run the risk of it looking slightly like a museum piece or an unnecessary homage to previous films. And yes, there is an element of that. You know, I, I would always talk a lot about how everything in the movie is passing for something. And I meant everything, including, you know, the costumes. For example, there are 1940s and 50s costumes in there. Claire wears them. So she's passing for someone who's in the 20s, among other things. You know, the, the, the production design is, is not true to the 20s either, but more symbolic of Irene's kind of inability to express who she is. So she's not necessarily decorating her house in a way that would feel entirely lived in. So it's minimal. But also the film itself has to be, in a sense, it has to have its own performance of cinema. <laughs> you know, so it's almost in dialogue with those movies, but I didn't want it to feel stuck in time or like that's what it was all about because I do think that the, the story is contemporary and has a sort of very fresh and necessary sort of feeling to it. And the one way that I was quite convinced that we could stop it being a museum piece was with using very, very modern and expressionistic sound that was specific to emotion and not conventional and, and not a conventional school. Um, anyway, I'm going on and on. Stop me. No, that's, that, that's, that's perfect. And one of the things that, you know, I think... Um, a conversation that I have a lot is a lot of, of uh, filmmakers and people in the film business tend to think of, of really powerful expressionistic sound design as a, you know, a, a tool for, you know, big budget Hollywood studio films. And it's one of the reasons why we created the Dolby Institute Fellowship, but it's one of the reasons why I absolutely love your movie because you're using sound in a very bold, adventurous expressionistic way and I would love for you and Jacob just to maybe even use the sequence at the at the party with the teapot as an example of the way you're using sound design to communicate Irene's internal mental state as she becomes increasingly agitated as she imagines what may or may not be happening between Brian and Claire and just talk a little bit about the actual how you do that so so you've set yourself this challenge which is I'm going to use sound to to communicate this internal state for this character, and how did you go about doing that? Well, in retrospect, I wish I'd recorded a lot more of the sound at the party, um, but that was a mistake that I made as a first-time filmmaker. Like, I didn't record as much of that conversation in situ as I would have liked, um, and it bugs me to this day. But <laughs> I think what we got is what was intended, which, I mean, Jacob, jump in, but I, well, you know. Um, I'd actually like to start this, and I, this is a little, I had this planned out, but I want to invoke uh, via Rebecca Hall, I want to invoke James Baldwin. Uh, Rebecca posted this, I actually spent the last 24 hours memorizing this, but <laughs> since I'm now overcome by nerves, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to go to my phone to access this. Okay, I, I, because this actually, you know, James Baldwin was a genius on so many different things. I had no idea that he had such insight into the process of creating the soundtrack for a movie. <laughs> so this is, this is how the quote goes, and then I'll explain why this is apropos to the teapot scene. Um, and uh, Mr. Baldwin said, every writer has only one tale to tell, and he has to find a way, or she, of telling it until the meaning becomes clearer and clearer, until the story becomes at once more narrow and larger, more and more precise, and more and more reverberating. So what does that mean? It means God is in the details. And it means that that, that process of, of arriving at what we did for that scene was a process of how do we get inside of um, Irene's head what precise sounds will we hear to enable this scene to really reverberate um, in the end? And so, you know, that was the process. And it was, 
a process of discovery. I know Rebecca had an idea. Sound is very hard to talk about. So Rebecca had an idea, and I knew it was a very specific idea for how that scene should play out and how we should wind up somehow in Irene's head. <laughs> but how, how do we actually do that? So um, through the pro one of the things, one of the great things about this particular project is we had actually the benefit of time not by design, but by COVID and by a few other factors. We we're able to mix and then step away from the mix, sit with the mix, and then revisit the mix. And thanks to the Dolby Institute, we got to go back and mix the film again. So back to that scene. Um, eventually, you know, what I think we arrived at independently, but together but separately <laughs> is is that um, we need to hear Irene's voice more loudly than normal you know mm -hmm. because she hears you know we're, we're with her and we need to be intimately with her and how do we do that we make her voice louder we push the voices of the other people in the room further away mm -hmm. so she's having to serve these people at this gathering she doesn't want to be there she'd rather be alone um, but she has to be there and do this. So, so she's, you know, serving them. They're right next to her, but they sound like they're far away. And as she walks down the hall, she's shaking. Um, so we hear via Foley, you know, we have the, the teapot rattling and shaking. Um, and then, and the, the, the voices at the party are muffled. And then at the critical moment, right before she drops the pot, she suddenly moves into another room. She hears her friend who comes running up to her, uh, Felice, and um, suddenly she's surrounded, realizes all these people are there, these, these critical people in her life at that moment. Um, and then she drops the pot and it reverberates and it's um, then very silent. And hopefully we can feel all of that through her. You know, this, this is a case of, of heightened emotion of nerves of anxiety of of all yeah. of that so you know i that's i think no i was just going to jump in and talk about yeah. the you know you using and sort of antithesis essentially mm. so like you know and and this is something that crops up obviously visually like you see things that are in contradiction with what people are saying, which is really the only way that you can reveal subtext, but also it happens repeatedly with sound. And I think this is is that moment because you see you see what she's concentrating on, which is just this physical held of like not falling apart, literally not dropping the teapot. But you hear also what she is trying to be, which is, you know, the lady of this party. But she's not really in the party. She's not really, she's on the outside of it. She's in this place of, I'm about to fall apart. And that, and similarly, you know, another moment that I can think of that sort of highlights this, reveals the sub subtext through contradiction, is this moment when, you know, she looks up and she says, I'm beginning to believe that no one is completely happy, free or safe. And the, the noise of the children thumping on her head becomes louder than it actually has been in the scene. You know, we've, we've been in that same room in that same space and heard them less loud. But in that moment, for her, that becomes a, a form of oppression in a way. And it is also a way of showing, which is very difficult to show that maybe deep down, maybe she is imprisoned by some of her choices and has a hard time with them. She can't say that. She's talking about something else. But for you, it starts to reverberate with that. Um, you know, similarly, like, you know, she hears whether or no matter how far away she is from something, you know, she might be sat right next to someone, I don't know, stirring their tea or talking about something in the tea room. That's irrelevant. She's not hearing that. What she's hearing is the sound of Claire's stockings rubbing against each other when she crosses her legs. <laughs> Because that's this sort of sensual moment that's suddenly like a sort of like horn in her ear, <laughs> you know, unlocking some kind of sensuality in her. And that forces you into that perspective. I'm really curious about the, the <clears throat> music, uh, because your approach to the music in this film is very non-traditional. And how did uh, Devante get in, involved? And, and did, you th did you think about having a traditional kind of score, and then you moved away from that idea? Or how did this come to be in, the, in its current? Why are you laughing? 
No, I'm, I'm laughing because I, I never did. I don't know. There was there were so many choices that seemed so absolute for me, and everyone always kind of looked at me like, "Are you out of your mind?" But anyway, wh one of them actually, I remember saying, "I'm also laughing because I remember a conversation that I had with my producers at some point when we. I mean, this was a super indie production. Netflix then bought it out of Sundance. Hallelujah! But we, you know every one of these choices meant that I had to make it for less and less money. I know that some of you know what that means. And it was, you know, we shot it in 23 days and et cetera, et cetera. But one of the ways in which I think I was trying to get an extra day was I remember saying to my producers, no, no, we don't need to budget for score. There's no score. There's no score. <laughs> like, and they all looked at me like, you going to change your mind about that? And I was like, no, no, there is no score. And... Whereas I did a little bit change my mind about that. Like, the idea was still the same. I heard this piece of music, which is the piano theme, which is really the only piece of sort of outside of the movie. Um, what's the convent, the real professional term for that? You're talking about diegetic? Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, yes. It's the only piece of music that is diegenic. And... That was a piece of music that I heard about five years ago, I think, when I was redrafting it. You know, and there's a really tough thing. I know some of you out there are filmmakers. There's, one of the hardest things about directing a movie is trying to describe to people tone. Like, right. And it's also one of the, the, the biggest jobs. It's like you, you're sort of, you're organizing a group of people to do what is inside your head. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you, right. <laughs> how do you communicate that? And, you know, yes, endless pic I drew endless pictures, endless storyboards, blah, 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 showed them the photos, did the whole thing. But I heard this piece of music, and I was like, oh, that's the tone of the movie. That is how the movie should feel. That's how it should look. Doesn't make sense, but it does. And then I found out that it was called Homeless Wanderer. And I was like, well, that's uncanny. So for me, that was the one piece of score. And if you think about it in sort of movie theme terms, it was, um, in a way, it was Claire's theme, but stuck in Irene's head. So you don't necessarily see it on Claire. You see it, you hear it when it's on Irene, when she's in these moments of repetition and monotony and she can't actually escape this piece of music. But then there was this other thing that I started thinking about, this whole other subplot where I was like, what about this guy over the road who's learning to play the trumpet? Um, he became this, <laughs> he became in a way Irene's theme in my head. He was like, he's a guy who at the beginning of the movie needs to be doing scales and doesn't know what his voice is. But then very quietly and very in the background, he starts to sort of find some sort of soul. He starts to find some sort of melancholy as well. But it And also it starts to sound like Homeless Wanderer. And that's Irene's theme, like trying to find who she is on some level. And that's where Dev came in. I was like, can you please do that? <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it uh, it was it was funny because you told Tessa about Homeless Wanderer, mm. right? And um, before I was involved, Tessa had asked me to make a version of Homeless Wanderer for her to just listen to on set in between takes, and so I made this version that was pitched down and would speed up again and would echo out and reverb to, you know, because uh, essentially as she's starting to not see a fixed reality. Um, and so, so, I, so I did that for, for Tessa. So, so the song was kind of already in my... Um, I was already thinking more about that piece of music than I did when I knew it before. I felt quite inside it. And then um and then I loved I loved that idea about the trumpet player. Yeah, I I I, I don't know if I'd ever come across that in a film before actually. The idea that there's this character that you never see who is 
musically describing someone's frame of mind and starts off in a way, uh, I don't want to say innocent, but like amateur and is learning and progressing. And it's so kind of subtle and then eventually picks up and morphs into this theme that we've been hearing throughout. And I guess that musically is really appealing to me. But then also all the other choices you made in the film are very appealing. Because I, I, I love the idea of things that make, things that subconsciously make, drag the audience along into the world where where they might know, like, again, like the 4-3 thing. Like if you're aware of film, then you look at it and you're aware that it's in 4-3. But if, you know, if you're not, you're, you, you're gonna watch it and you're gonna feel that tightness and you're gonna feel boxed in, you know, and, you're, and maybe you don't know why. So, so I love that idea and applying that to the sound. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and if I, I could, if I could just yeah. mention the other aspect of what uh, Deb, Deb did, yeah, I was going to say, which ties right <laughs> into what he just mentioned, is these these lurking low frequency tones that we we just kind of planted below the skin of the movie, and they're there strategically in different spots, and we're not even sure if we hear them or we don't, or you may have heard them, or you may not have, You're not, you, you don't know. We hear it at the beginning of the movie, we hear it in the hotel scene, uh, we hear it in the, the more prominently, um, you know, after Claire goes out the window and Irene comes down and bursts out onto the courtyard, then we really hear it. But those were, you know, those were important aspects to using something very much of, of today you know, of this time and technology yeah. and, and planting those and having those in the film, um, you know, really helpful. Absolutely. Also, he, he's not mentioning this, but the thing that, that the, mu the piece of music that you gave Tessa that was slowed down and had all that reverb -y stuff, you know, I got to listen to, which I was like, oh, this needs to go in the movie. And it is in that dream sequence. Like that is the oh, yeah. sort of remixed version. Um, all right, I, I can I can get I can get in trouble here because I could do this all day long, and I don't I have no idea. Do we have to, how much time do we have left? Okay, um, Rebecca, you said you shot the film in twenty three days. Um, it was a low budget affair. One of the things I also love about the sound design and the way you handle the the trumpeter off screen is you use the sound to paint the world outside the frame and to make the film feel much bigger in scale than you actually shot. <laughs> so can you talk about that and sort of how you how you and Jacob uh, sort of uh, uh, fill in the details that, that you don't show? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll speak to the sort of the why and then Jacob can speak to the how we did it. <laughs> I think it probably sense. makes sense. But I, you know, it's a sort of, Obviously, I couldn't afford to shoot a huge, like, you know, set piece of Harlem with cars and all the rest of it. But I will say, nor did I really want to. You know, there is something... I always had quite a counterintuitive feeling about how this movie should feel 1920s. I mean, we all think of the 1920s, we think of the jazz age, we think of noise and bustle and, you know, flapping dresses and all the rest of it. and. Yes, all that stuff is great, but this is really one, in essence, one woman's very claustrophobic worldview. It's narrow, it's not, and most New Yorkers don't get to see that big expansive view of the city unless they're sat in some high rise. You know, most of us just see like the patch of street that we walk every day and the four walls of whatever apartment we're in. And that, so that felt actually sort of useful in an odd way, but, I was also aware that there had to be a suggestion of the thing that she's at the peripheries of. And it also helps the cause because, you know, the first five or so minutes of the movie are very deliberately constructed in silence so that, um, how to put this? You know, like the people tell you if you're making a musical, there's stories about like, you've got to do a song within the first three minutes so everyone knows exactly where you are. 
I kept thinking about that, <laughs> funnily enough. I know this isn't a musical, but there was something about, unless you, for want of a better phrase, lean into this movie, like whatever you're bringing with you of your identity, of what you think about, of how you feel, whatever you interact, whatever that interacts with the movie is what you'll get out of it. You know, there are many interpretations and they all require a little bit of work, honestly. If you sit back and sort of just let it wash over you and take it, excuse the pun, at face value, not very much happens. So there was a little bit of a problem in my head of like, how do you signal the audience that you've really got to pay attention? You've got to look below the surface. You've got to like think. And this sequence with the feet was a way of sort of, and the sound is a way of, of forcing them, forcing you all to imagine the world that you're not seeing. Um, and forcing you into that place where you're doing more cognitive work and detectiveness, that's terrible, but than you would otherwise. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I think I can say with some certainty that pretty much every car horn and every bird tweet and every tiny minute detail of the city and noise that comes in everywhere is very specifically chosen and placed yes. under a line or, you know. But anyway, I'm going to let you go. No, that's, that's absolutely true. And it was a process, this winnowing process, again, you know, of, of the precise to, to lead to the reverberating is, is about um, my tendency as a sound designer it, because I feel like the world is full of sound in, in, in real life. There, there's sound all the time, you know, as someone once said to me, we're not born with ear lids. The sound is always there. But in a movie, it's, it's about um, making these choices and, chor and, and, and choreography and, and deciding when to focus on something, when to present something in the track and when not to. So, you know, I had a lot more birds originally, and as, you know, Rebecca can attest. Well, also, like, I do remember, like, when we first started working together, there was this moment where I was like, yes, of course, we, I, because we're not seeing any of the city, it has to be really noisy, and there was loads of construction. Right. But what I, I meant that sort of within, like, weirdly, I, I, when I said that, I was like, I mean that within a quiet movie, but that doesn't make any sense. Like, how do you make a quiet movie that also has construction noise? <laughs> like, right, right. I think we did it in the end. But, <laughs> but yeah, it, like, it, it, it's, a, it's funny yeah, because yeah. Uh, someone was talking about sil the movie has a lot of silence. I actually don't see this movie that way. I don't think there are very many moments, if any, of, of pure silence in the movie. If anything, it's maybe when Irene is at the window again towards the end of the movie is are the quietest moments of the film. But actually, there are some quite loud sounds that happen within, you know, uh, silence, so to speak. So, for example, the the um, the clock chime that Irene w hears when she dozes off and it wakes her up. You know, that was always even from your from before I was on the project. That was always meant to be a very loud shocking, um, disturbing in a way, you know, just a um, arresting sound, just just for how loud it plays, you know. So, so yeah, it's, it's a question of, you know, um, the car horns from the period, the, the elevated trains from the period, um, the telephone from the period, but then the natural world, the wind, the dogs, the crickets, you know, those are timeless sounds, and there's, uh, we did talk about having both of those natural elements and those kind of mechanical urban elements both at play, um, and uh, yeah, so I, 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 I love that. It's, it's yeah. a... Uh, I, it's, I, I've known for a long time, it's one of the dirty little secrets of our business. Uh, oftentimes, it's much easier to get away with, you know, big action sequences and gunshots and yeah. car chase, because oh, you can okay. always just throw a bunch of stuff at it. The quiet stuff is actually no, really hard. Building a quiet movie was, I mean, it took, you know, however many mixes we did in the end. And right. every, I mean, I just remember every time I was like, it's not there yet. Keep it, so we got to, right. then, thank goodness for you guys, honestly. Well, <laughs> and, and then I don't know how you did it. I, I, you made the sound of snow falling. I don't know how that's possible, but you actually were able to pull that off right. in that, in well, that moment of very quiet at the end, yeah. If you felt that and you heard snow falling, then we did our job, did you know, whether that's it's great. actually there or not. Shall we take some questions? My grandfather passed. He was African American and passed white his whole life. Every picture I've ever seen of him 
in black and white is usually overexposed. It's difficult to tell what he looks like. He certainly doesn't look white. My mother has effectively been white her entire life. She never looked white to me either. The movie's in black and white. It doesn't look like the real world. There is a deliberate abstraction that allows me to cast two black women. It was more important for me to cast women that you all have a fixed, fixed sense of what their racial identity is so that I have something from which to de destabilize that idea. Also call into question the slippery reality of all of this. Some people see some one thing, another person sees another. If you're a family where somebody crosses the color line and goes and lives their life white, I don't believe that any member of that family sees that person as white. They only ever see them as black. And that's the perspective I want all of you to sit in because it's scarier. Because you're seeing them and you're thinking, isn't everyone seeing what I'm seeing? Aren't they gonna get caught? If this had been white actors that for a start wouldn't have had access to the, what these two women are socialized at, at as a young age, I don't believe it would have been such an arrest day. All the things that you said, emotional experience, because there would have been a certain element of like, well, they look white. And there have been films that look like that about passing. That exists. You know, in 1929, when everyone had a very immediate sense of what, what the one drop situation meant, I would have been perfect casting for it. But I think now, our ideas of what constitutes race the social construct of race is different. I think it was more important for me to get a sense of that black perspective and that understanding than it was to cast women who look like they could pass. Because no one looks like they could do anything in the real world in this movie because it's in black and white. That's a great question. So the, the question, in case you didn't hear it, was uh, about uh, how Rebecca used lenses and the visuals and paired them with the with the sound design and uh, i'll just add to like i love the way you you obstruct so much you shoot through glass you mm -hmm. shoot through irene's hat mm -hmm. all of those things to sort of declarify what's going on mm. yeah well all of this stuff is about constantly destabilizing and making people look different according to different contexts and also it's about finding a way to show you that what the the person who you're trusting she might not be seeing clearly so the depth of field stuff is 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 sort of from irene's perspective things are going in and out of focus <laughs> is a sort of very literal way to put it but also the framing was very specific like we talked a lot about the moments where the choreography of of being careful about the moments that we shoot the two women together and shooting them from angles so that you can see one of them looking at the other one without the other one being aware. And also there are moments where Claire literally takes over Irene's position in the frame and Irene leaves it. So there is that sort of creeping, you know, in the geography of their movements. But yeah, we, you know, the thing, the sort of blurring on the edge of the frame or the curtains or the, I think it all helps with that same sort of motif. We looked a lot at Saul Leiter photographs and you know, I thought a lot about how to cut less, honestly, and to, to choreograph scenes where it's a lot is played out on two people so you can see the reactions in real time. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Also, lenses. Yeah, I, was, I was like, there's something else that she asked me that I wanted to talk about. Lenses. Yes, that's an interesting question. So Edu Grail, the cinematographer, found this, um, brought to me on the camera test. He was like, how about Lomos? And I was like, I don't know much about that stuff, but I sort of understood that that was a kind of like wide anamorphic situation. It was like, a, you know, if you shoot an entire movie on a Lomo, it looks kind of like a music video. <laughs> and, but if you, if you, use it with a 4-3 ratio, which is sort of unconventional, then you're forcing the focal point to the most focused point of the image. So you get this incredibly painterly quality of this sort of softness on the bottom and the top, but not kind of overwhelmingly so. It's just, you know, again, slightly subliminally um, fuzzy. 
If I could just quickly address the sound design aspect of the connection to picture. Um, first of all, there's an intuitive process that when we, we come on to do the sound, we're, we have the movie in front of us. Before we even talk with the director, the movie is there, so it speaks to us visually. And it's kind of up to us to transduce that, you know, what, whatever we're seeing visually, and make that work in terms of sound, even the way we mix the voices. But I can point to one sort of visual and, and um, you know, like um, blocking sort of thing, where there are numerous scenes where, or a handful of scenes, where Irene finishes a conversation, tumultuous conversation, and winds up alone. The person has left the room, she's closed the door, she's standing against the door, and we're just with her, and it may be a, a close-up, a tight close-up. Um, and we get the visual, we see how she's, you know, trying to process what just happened, but we had the thought that maybe we need to hear her breathing a little more than we are, you know, uh, what was naturally recorded on set. So we did go to some lengths when we did our ADR um, with Tessa to have her uh, record breathing for those moments, and then we were able to, you know, have that happen. So that's a, a place where, in a sense, the visual then inspires an idea for something that's sonic that happens. That's great. Well, that's all the time that we have today. Uh, I, again, I want to thank Rebecca, Devante, Jacob for coming and talking to us about the film. Uh, it's fantastic. Congratulations.